All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, today I get an opportunity to talk to somebody who I've been kind of like reaching out to and hoping to get into uh, into the podcast for a while. His name's Scott Morgan, but uh, from an artistic standpoint, you will probably know him as Lossil, L-O-S-C-I-L. He works in kind of the ambientish genre, but I know that a lot of you who are my listeners know of him because if nothing else, the artist name Lossel comes up an awful lot in discussions on the Lions community, in the Max community. There's a lot of us that are kind of into it. He's done a lot of interviews, which kind of help us uh, understand a little bit more about him, which I think helps us get in, in tune with him. And so I'm really excited to have him on the podcast. So now I'm going to shut up and talk to talk to Scott. Hey, Scott, how's it going? It's great. It's great. Thanks for uh, having me on your podcast. Yeah, well, it's really fantastic to to have you on. Um, it's funny because uh, we're talking and they're actually testing the tornado warning signals in the background. So I almost feel like uh, I'm getting a little uh, musical accompaniment to our, to our interview. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure if people are going to be able to hear that, but it's a, it's a little bit distracting for me uh, just because normally that's kind of bad, right? Yeah, yeah. I hope I was going to say I hope it's just a test. <laughs> yeah, it's like the first Wednesday of every month. And, and, so, and I really want to get out there and record it because it's a mechanic mechanical monstrosity it's this huge horn on a rotating motor it's nutty I, I really want to get out there at some point um for people who might not be familiar with your work um i would love for you to kind of explain a little bit about your uh about your lasso project as well as any other projects that you have, that you have going but you know quite frankly i and i mentioned it in the introduction I see your name come up an awful lot in terms of what people are listening to or what they're into. So um, I th- I think a lot of people will be aware, but I'd still like to kind of have you frame what your work is. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, Lossal as a project was started about 20 years ago. So I don't know if we want to get into the history too deeply right now, but it was basically, you know, I'm based in Vancouver and uh, I studied music here at Simon Fraser University and coming out of university in the mid to late 90s, uh, I was heavily involved in the kind of indie music scene here, you know, in rock bands and things like that. And I was kind of looking for a a musical space that kind of was somewhere between academia and what I had, you know, just finished studying, and then also the the rock world, which I was kind of growing out of. So I was really interested and excited about a lot of music I was hearing coming from Europe, you know, a lot of kind of what you would loosely call ambient music. Uh, and at, back in those days, you know, it was popular to call it glitch or there was, you know, artists like Marcus Pop, his right. Oval Project, Oval, and yeah. uh, Gas, and Pole, and there was all this music that was very exotic to me. That I, I, especially here in Vancouver, there was just nothing like that going on, and I was, I was really drawn into this kind of space. You know, that it, it sort of incorporated a lot of the electronic and electroacoustic and computer music ideas that I, that I had been exposed to, but also was maybe, for lack of a better word, more accessible and than a lot of the really academic music, which c- can get pretty far out there. Sure, right. So anyway, long story short, I, I started this project with, with a bunch of friends where we were doing kind of audiovisual performances at a local experimental theater called The Blinding Light. And we were doing these regular nights there. And I sort of tongue-in-cheek called this project Lossal because I liked the looping oscillator idea you know okay. of, the, of the loop of the lossal function from c sound and right. uh, started experimenting with audio and visual stuff and it it was you know even in its origins fairly ambient ish i was definitely a, an eno fan and really into a lot of the aphex twin ambient stuff and yeah that was kind of the birth of it probably around 98 or so and then uh, I sent a, a demo to a bunch of record labels, including Cranky, 
and they were interested in releasing my first full length, which came out in 2001, Triple Point. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the the origin story of Lossal, I guess, as a project. And I, I honestly would not have anticipated it lasting this long. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> kind of felt like I maybe would have moved on to other things at this point, but it's it's kind of lived its own life, and I, I enjoy kind of treating it like a, a sort of ongoing project and throwing things at it and taking things away from it and just seeing where it goes. And uh, it's it continues to sort of entertain me, so I, I, I keep doing it. Sure, absolutely. Now, um, I have, I mean, first of all, I feel lucky because in a way we have almost 20 years worth of releases of yours to be able to check out. Um, people can go to lossell.bandcamp.com and kind of see the uh, the body of work there. And it's enjoyable to be, enjoyable to be able to go back and, and kind of watch your development over that period of time. Uh, you talk about kind of being influenced by sort of that oval pole kind of uh aesthetic and i would say certainly some of those early albums really really owe a lot to that uh kind of sort of like the glitch driven kind of pulsy rhythm thing in combination with a very prominent bass line right yeah. that was uh that that you kind of took that concept but at the same time made it your own and what's interesting is as i've listened to the as i've taken the opportunity to listen to kind of the whole body of work it's it's cool to see that now, like twenty years later, you're you're doing work that's clearly, you know, growth and extension of of stuff that you did. But that there's sort of this voice, and I don't know if it comes from like the peculiar way that you do sound design, or some of the chord chord structures and chord changes that you use, um, that really kind of make things sound peculiarly yours. I mean, is there something that you personally identify as the thing that makes your music you? Um, yes, I think it is partly about process and it is partly about my approach, a lot of which was informed by my time uh, in university where, you know, I, I studied with Barry Truax, who was a very well-known, uh, you know, computer musician who was very instrumental in, in sort of real time, early experiments of real time granular synthesis. And, mm -hmm. um, also sort of straddled the communications department and was interested in carrying on the work of R. Murray Schaefer on, on sort of acoustic ecology and, uh, you know, listening to the environment and kind of using sounds from the environment. And, you know, it's, it's not a, uncommon practice obviously these days to do field recordings and to manipulate field recordings but i think this idea of lifting sounds from the world and transforming them and using that kind of approach to sound design and and some of those techniques including granular synthesis and convolution and you know various forms of kind of spectral processing i i think through those techniques kind of developed a palette that I was really attracted to. And I've, I've never really abandoned that, that fundamental process and that kind of love of taking and manipulating sounds and turning them into sort of deep, sort of massive textures. I mean, I, I'm just really attracted to that. Yeah, that's interesting. And yeah, I, I guess for me, when I, when I, if I were to put a stamp on something that would sound yours, it would be based on that kind of, the the large sort of like i i don't know i tend to think of your stuff as sounding kind of foggy a lot of times which yeah. is like such a weird adjective to use for music <laughs> except it's just like what comes to mind right it, it just happens to be a thing i think from a very early stage i was uh, you know influenced by composers like Ligeti and mm -hmm. Who are exploring things like, and you know, Barry Truax's work is like this too. But it's um, exploring density and exploring texture rather than melody and harmony and rhythm first. And and, it, and it's kind of a timbral way of of thinking about sound. And I, I think it in some sort of very natural way takes us into this kind of, for lack of a better description, womb-like kind of state where you're just surrounded by sound and immersed in sound and it really pulls you in and pulls you under in a kind of way so i i, I do i do love that and that's kind of the, that's the core of what the lossal sound is 
Sure. That's, that's cool. I want to come back to some of these ideas because there's a lot to explore there. But before we do that, one of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking to people a little bit about kind of their beginning story or their, or their, their travels in becoming the artists that, that they are now. And I'm kind of curious, what, what is your background? Where did, did you come out of like the band kid thing or the rock band thing or just or what how did you how did you get into the point you know because there's something not everybody kind of like comes out of middle school and high school and says well i'm going to go to simon fraser and study with barry truax right there's got to be some kind of connecting threads there and i'm curious what those might be yeah yeah so i i mean i grew up in a small town in in bc here in canada and uh on Vancouver Island and I was bored to tears to be honest in a small town and I got in my uncle gave me a guitar at around age 12 and around the same time I I was studying tenor and baritone saxophone in high school you know I I credit my grade seven band teacher for kind of allowing anyone who was interested to come into the band room you know during lunch or after school and just play around with instruments and just you know we had we formed a rock band and we, I started playing drums, you know, cause I, I've played drums for many years as well as guitar and self-taught myself guitar, but, but learned saxophone. And so I had this weird kind of initial mixed bag of exposure to instruments and musical ideas that was completely based on play and fun and was completely my own thing. And, and because of being bored in a small town, I think I, I just was really drawn into it. But on top of that, you know, as I was getting close to the end of high school, I knew that I wasn't going to be a rock star, <laughs> and but wanted to maintain a connection to music and, and the, the music industry somehow. So I had this kind of dream of becoming like a, a producer or a record recording engineer. And I, I remember talking to my dad about this, and he's like, well, look, there's this program at SFU, and he was an alumnus of SFU. And he said, it's, it's like a communications program that has this thread of acoustic and electroacoustic communication. They talk about computer music and it sounded interesting enough that I thought, okay, he convinced me rather than going to like a tech school or something like that to, um, to move to the city and try out university. And it just, to be honest, I ended up doing a double major in communications and music, mostly because of Barry's he was a joint professor and it just kind of opened so many doors for me. Not only the the technical sort of side of working with computers, which in the early nineties was computers doing audio was kind of a new thing. Right. Um, so there was a lot of interesting and exciting and rapidly changing stuff happening at that time. So it was just a really, it was, a, it was kind of an exciting time and things were, uh, my mind was exploding with ideas. And at the same time, I was still playing in, in rock bands as a drummer and a, and a guitar player. And, you know, I was working on four track tape recorders and manipulating sound in the most basic ways, uh, but was really just kind of drawn into this idea of recording sound, messing with it and seeing what comes out the other side. And, uh, it became an official practice in school where I also volunteered to do a lot of sound work for film, um, both scoring and sound design. And that led to after school working in new media and and then 10 years working as a sound director and sound designer uh, in video games. So I kind of was, you know, immersed in production uh, and, and also immersed in this idea of interactivity, which is, is still something that I'm very interested in and connects a lot to other sort of musical ideas. But, um, yeah, so that's the, that's the rather random meandering <laughs> origin story. Sure. Well, I mean, Barry, Barry Trax is sort of a, I would say he's sort of like a hero of the realm, you know, <laughs> in the computer music world. It must have been, uh, I mean, it sounds like you didn't necessarily know that much about him when you got into the school. What is it that, what is it about him and, and the things he was showing? What was it that caught your, your attention? Well, I think 
I mean, I say this because certainly the the stuff he was doing in computer music is about as far as musically speaking, about as far from playing guitar in a rock band as you can imagine. So I'm just yeah. curious, how did that capture your attention? I think initially the I mean Barry's of course known for his work in in computer music, but he's he's also uh, well, he's an in- incredible teacher in terms of uh, the basics of, you know, sound and how sound works and listening and what listening is and mm-hmm. um, what I was really drawn to. And yeah, I didn't know anything about him, you know, my first second year course in acoustic communications. I didn't know he was just another teacher. I, di- I didn't really know much about him at first, but what he kind of exposed me to is this idea of this well two things one is this the classic kind of idea of the studio as an instrument and using the tools of of a music studio or a, or a, in the communication sense like a just a, a generic sort of recording studio and using those tools to manipulate sound just uh to to sort of pitch things up pitch things down to edit like we did a lot of tape editing we did a lot of you know, because this was a transition time in the early 90s when yeah. I think universities kind of almost functioned a little bit like working museums, you know, and you had old technology interfacing with new technology. And I, it it was great to be able to learn how to cut tape with a razor blade because that gives you the paradigm, you know, for how Pro Tools works and things like this. So, Anyway, Barry Barry was very good at sort of laying the groundwork and exposing me to the fundamental ideas of listening, recording sound, and using the studio as a as a instrument to to make music with. That's that sounds like an amazing opportunity to to have him be available for those kind of introductions, because if nothing else, there's a there's like a a quality of like. Oh, you're getting that? Here, let me show you the next thing. And he's going to be almost yeah. an endless pool of what the next thing could be, right? Totally. I have just one really quick little interlude sure. um, with Barry because uh, I think it was about two years ago I was on tour in Europe and I was playing this amazing venue in Milan, the, the San Fidel Theater, which is one of these kind of multi-speaker venues, kind of under underground and it, a lot of the speakers are handmade and it's kind of like, I don't know how many speakers they have, like 48 or something in there. Okay. But I played this show in this amazing venue. And then after immediately after playing, this woman came up to me and said, Oh, there's someone I would like to like you to meet. And I looked over and it was Barry Truex. <laughs> who I hadn't seen in probably at least 10 years. Uh, and he was standing there and we had a big hug and I kind of, I'm like, what are you doing here? But yeah, anyway, on the other side of the world to have your old prof sort of, who's retired now too, show yeah. up and be at one of your concerts was pretty mind blowing. That's amazing. That's, that's really cool. Now you talk about this having been like some kind of, you, you keep on phrasing it as communication coursework. How exactly did that differ? But you also say that you kind of came out with a combination communication and music degree. What was the communication part and what was the music part? And how did how were those separated in the process that you went through? So the way that SFU is organized is the, yeah, there's an actual department. The School of Communications is a... Uh, it's considered an applied science and it's 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 a very vast and you know massive kind of faculty that covers public policy you know uh on communications law i mean we we touch on copyright we, there's like media studies and understanding you know the kind of classic kind of marshall McLuhan school of right of like media analysis and media sort of criticism and then there's like the more practical branches of marketing and I didn't take any of that stuff but there was a thread in in that faculty that Barry oversaw which was the acoustic communications portion which they had I mean one of the other things is compared to the music department they just had better funding so they mm-hmm. had a bigger studio and you know, probably more, more computers yeah yeah more more equipment and kind of a more vast array of equipment and a full-time staff member to keep it all you know going and sure. there was there was definitely an overlap and Barry himself was a joint professor with the music department but the music department had its uh, its own separate 
studios and you know they they also clearly had courses in acoustic writing like writing for instruments and I actually took two years of gamelan while I was there as well so they they had a kind of a, a completely separate and much more musically minded uh, program versus the communications which touched more on all of these other topics so it was a real traditional thing i mean like I mean, did you have did you put yourself through things like sight singing and all that kind of stuff yeah there were there were courses right. where we had to do some sight singing yeah it wasn't as rigorous as maybe a, a you know like a classical music style sure uh performance oriented music degree program but it was definitely more varied i mean i had some amazing instructors like rudolf Comerus, who i mean you know teaching kind of mid-century modern approaches to i mean like the the schoenberg school of kind of you know abandoning <laughs> tradition and and sort of inventing your own new way of writing music like that it was sort of that mindset versus the classically minded mindset but Right. Anyway, those things were definitely pretty fundamental for me in in terms of opening my my ears and mind to new ideas and and how technology could be involved in making music. Right. Well, what's interesting to me is unlike a lot of people who come out of a university with sort of a very traditional traditional music perspective, maybe with a little avant-garde sprinkled into it. It sounds to me like you came you came with having a lot of <clears throat> a lot of challenges to to tradition already having been presented to you so you didn't necessarily need to go through some sort of shocking process in order to get that no. as part of your life, right? No, in fact, it's interesting because I've always looked I mean if you want to call it the other side, but if I've always looked to the other side of the more classically driven music traditions in awe, you know, anytime <laughs> I like I have a really good friend not far from you in Madison, Wisconsin who plays cello for the um Madison Symphony and we've collaborated. We have another project that we do together and I, I mean his ability, you know, his physical ability to play that instrument just blows my mind and it kind of I, I look at it as like, oh, I, I really missed out on like, I, I will never achieve what, what he is achieving because I, I didn't start early enough and I mm -hmm. never picked a single instrument. I kind of became a master of none and I, I kind of am very envious of, of that. And similarly, you know, never, never studied piano and I still struggle with like my, my scales on a keyboard, believe it or not. But so some of those things I, I look at from my perspective as a fairly fumbly, self-taught, exploration-driven musician, uh, and I look at that side with awe and kind of envy because I, I just don't have that skill set. I guess, but you know, one thing I would say that I found really interesting about your music, and I think the reason it captures a lot of people's attention, is that it has a lot of, you know, it is it is at its core, fairly ambient, but you actually build in things like chord changes and structures and those kind of things that they're often very subtle. They're often not pushed to the forefront in a uh -huh. sort of a classical way, but it really is an intrinsic part of what provides the movement to the piece. And hence, to me, what ends up happening is that there is a satisfaction when you get to an end of a piece because structurally it feels like it was composed, right? Uh -huh. It's more, it's much, it's more to me than people whose work is sort of like sound designerly as its focus. Yeah, I think I, I, I consider myself a composer and I mean, even though, a lot of those structures you're speaking of are simple. I enjoy finding sort of, you know, a narrative and finding shape and finding um, surprise in in creating. And I think that's a, that's a compositional thing versus, like you said, uh, I do get a lot of satisfaction from also just creating soundscapes and and more kind of amorphous washes of sound but to me the the driving thing is to actually compose and i and i think 
you know, I've learned uh, of late, like my la- my last record is really has these ties to photography, and uh, and I think visually there's a very there's a very similar approach when you think of composing a photograph and looking for something that is almost a visual hook and then finding a way to frame it and there's a lot of kind of crossbreeding of of ideas with other media uh in terms of how to shape things in an appealing way and i I think that's composition even if it's in a really basic form it's composition sure that makes that makes a lot of sense to me now, one of the things that you're that in the interviews I've read about you have pretty consistently talked about is the fact that your primary instrument, at least for the lossal work, is uh, is the computer, and you are pretty unabashed in saying that that's your that's your instrument, that's the place where you have where you seem you feel like you have kind of virtuosity and where you've put your time. Mm-hmm. Um, how does that match up with the fact that you have this background also with guitar and drums and saxophone and all this other stuff? I mean, how does how does that feel like an instrument to you in the way those other things might have? And how did maybe working with kind of conventional instruments also inform you of how you would end up using the computer? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Or I, maybe I they don't, don't. Maybe there is no connection. Yeah, I don't I I, I think... It's funny because I'm tracing back. I, I think that one of the earliest moments, you know, where I realized the computer was central and interesting to me was when I could get my own computer. <laughs> and that was, mm. you know, and probably I think it was 1995. I had a student loan that had I had just enough money and I decided to just blow it all on a power pc mac that i could have at home and that was the first computer that i literally had sitting at home because otherwise i was using computers at the lab at school or you or in the studios at school right and there was something about the autonomy of having that studio in a box type idea at all times accessible and when the moment struck of being inspired or wanting to try something out there was this very powerful tool just sitting there and it was available and it was ready to go. And there's something about that immediacy that just became very natural for me to, to turn to the computer. And, and I mean, not to mention, you know, exposure to things like Max MSP and, uh, I mean, before that C sound, uh, these ways of creating sound and ways of kind of building things that felt, really like my own in some strange way, even though, you know, I'm clearly dependent on all of the engineering and all of the technology that has come before me. There's this idea that I I have so much power in my hands right now that I can, I can conceive of something and work towards it. And, and you can do it at at almost any time of the day. And there was something about that that just pulled me in. And I've, I've just never, never really found the same equivalent with other tools You know, like uh, synthesizers have never really caught my attention in the way that I keep wanting to get more into synthesis, but I I just can't. I just can't. I like to work with in a sculptural way with sounds that I've taken from the world. So they're complex sounds that I'm usually treating and and almost chiseling away at. And synthesis kind of is the opposite. You're you're yeah. working with fundamentals and building out. Building and I've, up, right? Yeah. yeah, I've always felt like that. Working from something, or working from nothing to something versus something to nothing, it, it's just easier. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, so, what what tools do you use to get your to do your stuff now? Uh, this these days, the centerpiece of most of my composition and performance is Ableton. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when Max for Live came onto the scene, I, I, I mean, up until Max for Live, I was building my own sequencers in, in Max. And I think it was the transition from Max 4 to 5 that there was just too much work to do to, to keep my, my patches going. And I kind of... And it was around the same time that Ableton, you know, and Max for Live showed up. So I was able to kind of port some of the core ideas or the core kind of patches over to Max for Live and then use Ableton for most of the sequencing. Mm. 
Sure, that's interesting. So in in doing that, how much how often do you find yourself like diving into Max for Live to to do sound development or are you able to do a lot of that just within just within Ableton itself? I mean, do you have like a bag of Max tricks that you kind of yeah, apply a lot? Like I, it's funny, like Max Max also became a, a tool for problem solving for me that is always there and I know that it's there if I need it. And it, for example, you know, for years working in video games, I could not find really good software to do the kind of batch processing I wanted to do. For example, you know, it's a very common thing in video games to have dialogue like voiceover that is processed to sound like it's coming over a radio. Right. Like a CB radio. And I couldn't find at the time, I couldn't find a, a tool that could batch process things in a convenient way. So I built my own in, in Max. And like to me, like Max is this great resource to have to just when there's nothing else available, you can you can build your own thing. And you know, so I use it for a lot of kind of nuts and bolts work now. For example, I I'm using Ableton for audio, but I use this program Resolume for video when I play live. And I found that the resolution of sending MIDI for things like opacity fades from Ableton to Resolume was because of MIDI being 128. Yeah, pretty steps, crude, right? Yeah. Yeah, you get this kind of these not very smooth fades. So I I wanted to use OSC for that, but you know Ableton doesn't have any built-in OSC. So I <laughs> I built like a Max patch to kind of make that communication possible. Sure. So in that sense, I'm using it all the time for nuts and bolts work and problem solving. But it's become less of a kind of core thing for sound design for me right, than, right. than it used to be. You actually mentioned something that was the next thing I wanted to ask about, which was development of visuals. I mean, you've got, uh, with some of your work, you've actually got some really nice video content that uh, that goes along with it anyway. But you also talk about doing doing visuals during performance. And even at the very beginning of your work as Lossal, you, were, you talked about there being sort of like this AV aspect to the thing that you and your friends were doing. How mm-hmm. did you get tied into to into working on visuals, and what is how does working on visuals either align and parallel what you do with audio, or how might it be completely different? Yeah, the visual the visual side of my work has kind of come and gone over the years, and it it, it was a fundamental part at the very beginning from a very experimental perspective of just trying to see you know what what you could do with visuals and in those early days like we're talking late 90s the what was available for visual stuff was pretty rudimentary and i I think i even was using macromedia director right because it had a plug-in that could read the audio level you know from an input and you could map that to and i had some director background from work in in multimedia so i kind of understood it enough that i could build some connections but what i got frustrated with you know com- the computer at the computer power at the time was not capable of doing much very interesting visual stuff and you couldn't really play vid- like video files you had to do kind of generative stuff and it just ended up looking kind of like a glorified vu meter or a or a kind of screensaver and i got really frustrated with the lack of kind of ability to express with those tools so i abandoned it and went you know audio only for many years but then in the last i don't know five or six years i've gotten really heavily back into making my own video and really enjoy it and enjoy the the kind of parallels between music making and finding interesting connections between musical, you know, passages and visual shapes or uh, themes. And, you know, I, I think I've, I've kind of gotten to a point where I feel really comfortable with it and I feel really happy with the, the ability to express myself using those tools. And, and now I'm kind of almost conceiving new work with visuals in mind and, and, you know, I have a, I'll have a plan that's kind of how I envision a, a live performance as a whole, like as both a, an audiovisual whole. Interesting. I I saw a video piece. I think it was for one of the equivalence tracks uh, yep. that had these like cloud forms 
I don't know to what extent you composed that visual or if it was just, you know, there's this thing that happens sometimes where if you just, if you have audio and you have an interesting moving video, your mind will just like work really hard to find a cool connection between the two of them. And so I'm not sure what the story was with that, but I just like, (laughs) I was just got like hypnotized because to me, I was hearing like, I was hearing things and like seeing changes. I was like, oh man, that's so cool how those (laughs) effects are tied together. And I was like, yeah, I do that sometimes too. And it's normally, I just like literally take a video and slap an audio on it. It's like, oh shit, look how that worked. You know, it just worked. (laughs) I know. I mean, my whole life I've relied to some extent on happy accidents for sure. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but I, I do also like designing some of those connections and I, I find that I find it really satisfying like there's something even just this you know I use a lot of geometric uh, sort of two-dimensional geometric shapes on top of video imagery like from the real world and like I, I love that I sort of the like you know when a bass note comes in if you can tie that to a giant black circle on the screen there's just something really satisfying about that synchronization that that i i can't get enough of i don't know it's it's hard though in doing that to not you know not also end up with that sort of like um clown dunk kind of a thing where it's like oh every time this happens you know the clown goes in the water and so there ends up it's it's funny it takes a while to actually get out of the idea of saying synchronization doesn't mean you know a, a, a robotic slaving to something like that either no i know i know what you're saying and i think uh i think it's a delicate balance of you know trying to use these tools and and i mean it's the same with within one medium like when you talk about music like you you talk about repetition and you always want to find that place where repetition gives you something positive and maybe you you take it to the edge where it's about to become something negative i mean you know you think of philip glass and steve reich as masters of this it's like you take it <laughs> you take it to that edge of like oh this is about to become really annoying really? and <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> and then it goes somewhere else and and that in itself becomes really satisfying and i right. think there's i think there's something about that with visual stuff too that you you almost build a language of expectation but then you break that expectation and that becomes itself kind of satisfying yeah so true now as as a person who is really who who really uses the computer as instrument when you play live what does that look like how how do you build a system or a structure that gives you the freedom to be performative when you're live, uh-huh. but also really takes advantage of the fact that you have this amazing studio in a box and, uh, you know, can kind of make all the noise. And if you wanted, you could completely script your performance. But where, what does your balance look like and how do you make it so that it's a, it's a, a valid expression tool for yourself? Yeah, it's a funny conversation because I've, I've I actually went through years of struggling with this idea, and I think I just in the last number of years I've done a couple really subtle things that have helped me, <laughs> and I don't know whether they help the audience, but adding visuals was actually one thing where it's maybe to just distract from the idea that I'm standing there pressing buttons or whatever. The other thing is just visually, you know, I can't stand seeing that Apple logo on screen and or on stage, you know, and so I actually try to hide my laptop Mm -hmm. (laughs) to the side and I actually have trained myself to not need to look at it. And I have so I have controllers I you know, I use a couple of Akai controllers at the moment, but I've been through so many different MIDI controllers over the years. But what I usually like to have is some combination of a mixer uh, that allows me to bring things in and out, you know, trigger, I'm triggering live clips, obviously doing some effects sends and some, some live processing. And then I have a, at the moment I have a, a keyboard as well, where so I'm playing and I, and I have some MIDI loopers and stuff so I can kind of play on the keyboard and grab things and loop them and layer them over top of some pre-established structures. Okay. So, you know, I used to feel kind of compelled to do more in terms of live spur of the moment kind of construction of ideas and i mean for a while i had a little tabletop slide guitar that i was 
playing and, and grabbing stuff from and processing. And I, I just found like compositionally, I couldn't, I couldn't achieve what I wanted to achieve. And I stopped being worried about this idea uh, that the art I'm presenting is the art I'm presenting. And if you consider there's some sort of spectrum from complete free um, improvisation to complete playback of a theatrical movie with score, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle (laughs) and, (laughs) and I'm kind of content with that. Like, I don't feel like I, I need to do anything more or anything less. This is my art and this is how I present it. That's really cool. And that's, that's a awesome perspective. So unfortunately our time is already up. I can't believe it. But, um, before we go, I'd like to ask, ask, you what is next what's what's around the corner for you and what new work might you might you have in the hopper i am really interested in photography and part of my you know the equivalence record which just came out in august has this tie to you know not only the work of alfred stieglitz the sort of early 20th century photographer but also to my own photography and i'm This has kind of become a new thing for me where connected to the visual element of my live performance, I'm really interested in the visual element of presenting music and photography together. And uh, so I have have an idea for a a project that is kind of basically a photo book with accompanying music that I'm – the music doesn't exist yet, but the photos are kind of there. And so I'm thinking about a way to kind of bring that to life. And then I just finished working on a – a game, sort of a score for a game that is out now. It's called Lifelike, and, and so I'm kind of working on this, um, perhaps a soundtrack release for that. Wow, that sounds great. And then you also mentioned the uh, the collaboration that you're doing with a cellist. Do you have any releases from that? Yeah, we have one that came out a couple of years ago. So the project is called High Plains, and uh, we actually, you know, had a residency in Wyoming a few years back and sort of built this record on site and cranky released it a couple years ago so it's it's out there if you want to check it out and and mark and i have you know we're constantly in conversation about what to do next but we haven't found the path for our next collaboration but yeah that's that's always kind of hovering around too sounds amazing well, Scott, I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to have this chat. It was really great to get to learn a little bit more and, and to sort of imagine how you do the things you do. It, it's um, You're so thoughtful about this stuff, and, and I love talking to people that put that kind of energy into the process. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And it's, uh, yeah, it's nice after seeing your name for so many years to <laughs> actually have a conversation with you. Well, I appreciate it, man. And with that, I will let you have the rest of your day. Have a good one. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Many thanks for Scott for having that great chat. It was really interesting to hear more about his background, but also how he kind of does the things he does, and especially his use of the computer as an instrument. I think this is something that we're seeing more and more people willing to discuss and describe Um, a couple of notes before we go first of all uh, if you happen to be here in Minneapolis uh, I'd like you to be aware of the in situ festival for electronic music and sound art it's happening from December 4th through December 7th uh, at a variety of places Um, you can look it up on the internet Uh, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of concerts that you have to get tickets for. Otherwise, there's a lot of free talks. Uh, it's put on by a couple of people I've gotten to know here in town, and it looks really interesting. Secondly, um, I want to uh, thank the people that have been sending me their music. I have really had a great opportunity to hear some new stuff. Uh, keep that stuff coming. I really do appreciate it. And finally... Um, If you are at all interested in helping to support this podcast and the work we do, not only the the podcast and audio version, but the transcription work that we're doing and some of the other stuff, please uh, join me on patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. And become a patron. Uh, 
I really do appreciate it. There are a few extras that I provide as uh, to the people who are my patrons, as well as early access to transcription, stuff like that. Uh, please join me, and uh, I really do appreciate it. And finally, thanks to Bernhard Wagner for his help with putting together some of the technology we use to help out with the transcription work. It's making it already so much faster. I really want to thank him. If you're interested in helping out the project as well, please let me know. DDG at Cycling74, DDG at 20objects.com, or darwin.gross at gmail.com. Any of those will do. With that, I want to thank you for listening and have a great day. Bye.